We good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. So, ladies, how many uh, how many qualities did I say there were last week? Fifteen qualities, right? So, as we go down the list of the fifteen, the first one was selfless love is patient. Selfless love number two is kind. Selfless love is not jealous. Number three, number four and five, selfless love does not brag and is not arrogant. Number six, selfless love does not, is not rude. Number seven, selfless love does not insist on its own way. Number eight, selfless love is not irritable. And number nine, selfless love is not resentful. Doesn't take into account wrong. And so that brings us to week, I mean, to number 10 and 11. So let me read again from 1 Corinthians. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I, am, I gain nothing. And then here's what we're studying. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Number, uh, verse eight, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Just as a reminder, lady, we have, we have two more uh, sessions together, is that correct, or three? Well, two, and then you're doing the brunch? Uh, it depends on how far we get in the next two weeks. Oh, the brunch is May 1st. Okay. All right. Well, that's all right. We can. After, just after. Right. Um, 
So number 10 and 11, selfless love does not, selfless love does not rejoice in wrongdoings and unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Well, see, so love never takes satisfaction from sin. Okay, love never takes satisfaction from sin or our own sin or other people's sin. Okay, and that's important to realize. But, uh, Tori, there's an echo I'm getting. Can you? Can you adjust that if you can try on the sound? What's that? Okay, never mind. Don't mess with it because then I'll get yelled at tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Um, can you just turn the volume down on mine? You see mine up there? It's a little level. It should, should just, there you go. There you go. Um, as long as it's coming in. <clears throat> so to rejoice in unrighteous, unrighteousness is to justify it. Okay, think about that for a second. What does that look like? To rejoice in unrighteousness, to rejoice in unrighteousness is to justify it. Give me an example. You probably did it this week. Did you watch television and enjoy anything that was ungodly? Did you watch a show that promoted fornication, adultery? Wow, that really hit home, didn't it, Pastor? You watch, you watch, do you enjoy watching programs that, that make fun of your Lord and Savior? That's what you're doing when you're, rejo you're, you are rejoicing, you are enjoying sin. I remember when, um, when, uh, 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 Ray Comfort was stopping some people outside of a movie theater and they were going in and he was talking to them, this is out in California. And he said to him, he said, uh, you know, this, this movie's rated R, and the reason, the reason it's rated R is for the, a lot of the nudity scenes in it and, and language. And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, but, you know, we, we know how to protect ourselves in that, and we're not really concerned about that. We come here for the movie. And the guy goes, well, okay. He said, so how does it make you feel when they blaspheme your Lord, when they use your Lord's name in vain, the one who died on the cross to set you free from sin? How, how does it make you feel when you hear them curse your God. Well, you know, it's, it's what the world does. Yeah, but you're going to go see it for entertainment. And they thought, well, you know, well, that's, and then he said, well, what, you know, there's a scene in this movie theater where, uh, a, a, a man and a woman are, are engaged in sexual activity together on the screen. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's no big deal. He said, well, let me ask you a question. He said, if you and your wife were at home and you were in your bedroom and you were being intimate and all of a sudden you saw five of your neighbors standing outside the window looking at you having sex what would you think guy goes like well of course i'd be upset he said well isn't that what you're doing aren't you just standing outside this bedroom window looking at him some, watching somebody else have sex you see christian god tells us to to rejoice in unrighteousness is to justify it and we should do everything within ourselves not to not to let the sins of the world come into us. You see, it's making wrong appear to, to be right. You wonder how we get to the situation we're in now. Everybody's uh, up, up in arms about how, 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 how did we wake up one morning and everything is, is we say or do, it comes into scrutiny, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Pee Pee Le Pew or, or Mr. Potato Head or whatever it is. Uh, it, it, it's offensive to somebody, but yet you can get on the Grammy Awards and talk disgustingly filthy lyrics in a song. Somehow that's not degrading to women. Uh, you know, how, how does that happen? Well, because we justify our entertainment. We say it's art and we justify it and we don't want to be getting involved in that. But Christians, you, you know, you're the ones that are supposed to be what? You are blank and blank in the world. There you go. Matthew, right? We are salt and light in the world. We are to be the preservative. We are the ones that stand firm on the truth. And then we are to shed the light of the gospel and the light of righteousness into that dark world. Remember, it's dark and creepy. Um, evil loves the dark. And so uh, we're warned of that in Isaiah. Chapter 5, verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Isaiah warns, who submit darkness, substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. And that's, 
you know, we're not in anything new. I, I remember when I said this statement probably 25 years ago, and, and it was people going, ah. I said, we don't live in a Christian nation. We don't live in a Christian culture. We live in a Greek culture, a New Testament Greek culture. The same thing that the Corinthians had to deal with in their city, the same thing that the, the city of Ephesus, Philippi, all these letters that Paul wrote, you can insert Amelia right in there, Chesterfield, Blackstone, Powhatan, you can put those in there, and it's the same kind of living. And we are told that we're in the world and not of the world. The problem with, with Christians is, all of us, is that we have blended so much into the world that it's really hard to distinct between who is a Christian and who isn't anymore. By their lives. As a matter of fact, we'll make fun of them. You know, uh, I remember, and, and Kathy always laments that she did this when she was a young, we were a very young woman. We were 20 years old, we got married, and she was working full time, and she was working at Safeway. And there was a young lady that, were, that was friends with Kathy and a couple of other ladies that worked there. Well, she was, she, you, would, she would, you would say she was a godly young woman who loved the Lord. And I remember Kathy talking about her like, she was a real prude. And, and, and Kathy has always lamented that as she had matured in the faith. She thought to myself, here was a young woman standing for Christ when we weren't. And ladies, uh, all of us need to understand that the world will mock you when you do make a stand. And I don't mean you look down your nose at other people. I don't say, I can't believe you're doing that. I say you live that lifestyle so that they see a difference in you yourself. Um, and then here's the other one. If someone you don't like, somebody you, you really don't like being around falls into sin, you don't gloat about it. You don't gloat about it. You grieve. At least you should grieve because God is grieved over sin. A Christian should never obviously gloat over anybody having sin, but, but especially those that you don't like, don't look at them and go, well, glad it happened to them. You see, because if they repent, you should rejoice. Whenever uh, a, a Christian brother, sister in Christ uh, commits sin and they repent of that sin, that just that should bring up a time of rejoicing for all of us involved. And see, there's a fine balance to love. Although love is kind and overlooks the faults of others, it does not compromise the truth to take a soft view on sin. I love you enough, and I, I hope you love me enough that you share truth with me. I love you enough to share truth with you. I, if I didn't love you and didn't care, it's the old, the old adage when you have children, um, when you have to punish your child, you're not doing it because you enjoy punishing them. You do it because you love them. You're trying to correct their, what they're doing. When they run out to the road, when you've told them not to run out to the road and they're heading off the road, you see a, a truck coming down the road and your, your life just flashes before your eyes and your heart's up in your throat and you're running as fast as you can and you snatch your child up and they, you've constantly told them, well, you're just not going to say, hey, that was a good boy. What's that? <laughs> they're going to get a whipping. So to remind them that the, when I run to the thing, either that or a dog collar, when I run to the gate and when I run to the road, uh, mama's going to take uh, my hide off. So because you love them. And it's the same thing with ours. If you have a sister in Christ who is engaged in an activity that that is sinful, you go to them in love, not condemnation, but in love. And you and you stress the importance of rightful living. See, to allow another person to go on in sin, whether it is known sin or a blind spot, is not to seek their best. You know how I know you love me? When you're seeking the best for me. That, that's, that's how my wife knows I love her. You know, Kathy told me the other day, she said, you know, what you tell couples is so true. And uh, uh, one of the things I do in premarital counseling is I tell the prospective husband and wife, I said, you know, the husband... Scripture says the, to respect your husband. There's a reason for that. The husband goes to work. He doesn't care whether anybody loves them. He wants respect. And the worst thing you can do to your husband is disrespect him, especially in front of other people. 
well, you've just you've just taken his legs out right from underneath of him. That's that's the respect. Women, the love. One of the things that women desire is security from their husband. It's security. They need to know that their husband loves them as Christ loves the church. To know them that nothing will come in between them except the Lord. Nothing else will come in between his love for her than the Lord. And then that that love translates into making sure there's a roof over our heads and there's a food in on the table and the wife is not worried that her husband's not going to come home and she's going to leave her with the children with no income and and that's the thing about love desires the best when a husband and wife become one when you became one with your husband you are one flesh and so every decision that Kathy and I make, I'm making, not, not, you know, if she wants to do something, it's, it's together we're doing it now. It's my desire is to have her desires met. And it took me a long time for that. I mean, I already spilled my guts last two weeks ago. It took me a long time to get there. And so I don't want you to, you know, think that, that uh, it's, it, wow, some husbands are greater than husbands. Well, all of us have our, our weak spots and all of us have our good spots but the thing is that I, I try to encourage the husbands and and again I I shared this with them and I share this with them is that they need to love you as Christ loved the church if we could just get our husbands to do that just think of the marriages that would be saved and the contentment that would be in in the wife so I preach it to them constantly so if they're not listening come tell me and I'll knock them over the head for you um, so Love rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices with the truth. What does that look like? Love rejoices with the truth. So one of your sisters in Christ calls you up and says, look, I, I, I need you to pray for me. Um, my husband isn't loving me like Christ loved the church. I don't need you to go tell any other buddy in the church, please. I'm just confiding this in you. I don't. I don't want other people to think badly of my husband, but, but I'm at a low point and I need you to pray with me. I don't need you to go talk to anybody else about it. If I can encourage you ladies, if, if that was the one thing that can get us trouble more than anything else is when somebody shares something in confidence, you don't, don't tell somebody else. Just, just don't tell them. And you know who you can tell, you know, um, telephone, tell a friend, Tell somebody, you know, and they'll tell everybody else. Um, keep that confidential. But what happens when you're praying for that person? And you faithfully prayed? And then that woman calls you up? And you could hear the joy in her voice as she tells you, God has answered our prayers. My husband is doing this, this, this now. What do you do? Rejoice. <laughs> You rejoice with the truth, right? You rejoice that this has come to fruition. And ladies, we need to do that. As, as Christians, we need to rejoice with one another. We need to be excited for what another brother or sister is going on in their life. We need to be, we, it doesn't need to always be about us. It needs to be about others. You know, John, the apostle of love, wrote, I have no greater joy. I love this. It's in 3 John, verse 4. I have no greater joy than this. This is what John's writing. To hear of my children walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than this. To hear my children walk in the truth. And he's speaking, obviously, of his spiritual children. John is. It's 3 John, 3rd epistle of John, verse 4. I have no greater joy than this. To hear of my children walking in truth. And, and, and as a shepherd and as a pastor, when I hear, when, when people tell me about you, the church, and what you do in the community, it, there's no greater joy in my life than to hear what you're doing. And, and, and ladies, it's the same with you guys. It should be when, when you hear of things that are going well with the body of Christ, you're rejoicing in that. See, at first glance, it may seem strange to contrast not rejoicing in unrighteousness, we're rejoicing in the truth. Why would Paul put both of these together? But the truth Paul is speaking about here is not simply factual truth. He's speaking of God's truth. God's revealed word. 
And that's what he's talking about here with the rejoicing in the truth. Righteousness is based on God's truth and cannot exist apart from it. Let me say that again. Righteousness is based on God's truth and cannot exist apart from it. I, I did a funeral yesterday afternoon. Uh, it was for Anthony's mother. You know, she passed away back in January. And because she was at the Veterans Cemetery and there was a bunch of red tape they had to get through, we, we weren't able to do it. So almost two months later, she gets buried. Very small because we're at the Veterans Cemetery. It was inside. It was limited to 25 people. And I preached from Hebrews chapter 4. And what I taught about there was when it talks about Jesus being the, our high priest. And I, and I said that in this passage I think it started in verse 11, went through 17. I said in that passage, it's got the greatest blessing and the most dire warning in that passage. Because the blessing tells us that we have a high priest that goes before us and makes intercession for us. I said, but here's the warning. The author of Hebrews talks about the word of God being a two-edged sword. Okay, so the Roman gladius, which was the Roman legionnaire's weapon, was, was sharp on both sides because the Romans didn't slash with their weapons. They, they held their shields up and then they would just strike with their weapons out and it would cut. It would make a clear cut incision, it would go, go all the way and it would cut bone and muscle, the, it says. That's the word of God. And so the word of God, the truth of God goes into us. And for those who do not know Christ, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of judgment. Because that truth reveals to them that they do not know him. And on that de dreadful day that they stand before the Lord at the great white throne judgment. And they talk about all the things they did. And he says, you may have known me, but I never knew you. You see, Christian, there's a difference there. And when people tell you you can lose your salvation, Jesus didn't say, I knew you and then I don't know you. Jesus said, I never knew you. So there, if you're ever looking for a verse that talks that you can't lose your salvation, it's right there. And then, and, then, and then Jesus says, I don't know you. I don't know you intimately. The word of God allows us to know the Savior. It's through the Holy Spirit that we're saved. He made you dead ladies and me a dead man alive in Christ. And now that we're alive in Christ, the word of God, it comes to us and it pierces us like a two-edged sword. And it reveals the truth to us. And so love cannot tolerate falsehood or false teaching. And that's that kind of, he, he's bringing this in here. And, and, and he, again, Paul constantly dealt with false teachers within the church. And part of love is that we do not tolerate falsehood or false teachings. Love cannot tolerate wrong doctrine. You know, some churches, they say doctrine is not important. Theology is not important. You just need to talk about the love of God every week. Just that's all you need to do. Just get up there, tell a little, couple little stories and say, Jesus loves you and come to Jesus. Everything will be fine. Well, the problem with that, Jesus constantly taught doctrine constantly you, you you've seen it through the the gospel of matthew and so and the apostles they laid out there oh what it's what what a christian life should look like uh, that's our theology and that's the doctrine we understand that the doctrine of the trinity if we if we don't somebody who claims to be a brother or sister in christ and you ask them who jesus is and he say he was a created being what would you say that's heresy. Jesus is not a created being. He is God incarnate. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He is fully man and fully God. He did not lose his divinity as some would teach. And see, it's important that we know these things. Because if somebody is standing there teach, trying to teach you something, I don't care how good they are. If they start teaching you something and you know inside of you because you know the truth that it's wrong... You don't need to listen to them. Don't listen to them. I, I, I remember one time when I was witnessing, I, I was on the SWAT team and I was witnessing to our commander. His name was uh, uh, Starnes, Marvin Starnes, big old man, uh, a cop's cop. And he'd walk down the hall, he would take his fist and he would beat it on the wall as he'd walk. Everybody knew he was coming through. He was just a big, big man. 
And he'd come through, and, and we all kind of looked up to him. We were in SWAT training, and we we're all in this little van. It ain't like all they have all the money now in the world to buy all the SWAT stuff. We, we were in this little dinky little van laying on the floor going, on, going to training. And we're sitting back there uh, across from each other in the van. And uh, uh, Hal Moser, who always made fun of me before he became a Christian, was, was mocking me. Y'all better be quiet. Mark's going to start preaching here. Man, somebody better start talking because he's going to be handing the plate out. And then Marvin spoke up. He's a Mormon. He was a bishop in his church. And he starts talking to me. He says, you know, Mark, he says, it's just a shame that, you know, you're such a good guy, but you're just confused. I said, Lieutenant, I said, there's no confusion here. The only confusion is that you believe in the doctrine straight from the pits of hell. And the, you could have dropped a pin in that van. It was like, he's going to cave your head in. And, but to be honest with you. I, I thought after I said it, it was like, that was stupid. <laughs> and uh, he didn't say anything. He just laughed. He just laughed. He said, I tell you what, Mark. He said, I, I, he said I'll sit down and discuss with you if, you if you do one thing for me. And I said, what's that? He said, if you would read the Book of Mormon. I said, I don't need to read that trash. <laughs> his smile went from his face at that moment. I said, Marvin, I mean, Lieutenant, I would never call him Marvin. <laughs> I, said, I said, Lieutenant, I said, my hope is in Christ alone. He is the son of the living God. He is not a created being. He was and he always will be. That was the end of the discussion. We never talked. And I remember he died about five years ago. They had a big ceremony at one of the Mormon uh, churches here. And I wept. I wept for Marvin. I hadn't, I hadn't seen him probably in 20 years. But I wept. Because I thought that man, he was a good man. He was a good man. He was a good cop. He would, he would give you the shirt off his back. He would do anything for his family. And yet that doctrine that he believed, he's in the pits of hell. And folks, so it's, it takes love to sit and talk to somebody. It just doesn't say, well, you believe what you want to believe, you're going to wind up in hell anyway. Have you ever had that attitude somebody? Have you ever hated something? Not hate, I don't want to, that's a really strong word. Have you ever disliked somebody so much that you wouldn't even want them to come to this church? That's a, that's a hard question, isn't it? Have you ever disliked somebody so much that if you were sitting here, right there in that seat, and you saw them walk in with another lady from the church, and they came by and they looked at you and you thought, I've never invited them to this church. You see, ladies, when we love the way Christ tells us to love, then the, we will even love our enemies to the point where we want to see them to come to saving faith. We will rejoice in good, not in evil. Sure, sure. If not you, who will do it? If, if not you. 
You remember that one Sunday when I, I think I asked it on Sunday morning, I said, um, when was the last time somebody actually shared the gospel with you? How many of you in this room have had some stranger come up and share the gospel with you? Raise your hand. I want you all to look around. Nobody raised their hand. Not, not one of you have had anybody walk up to you and say to you, hey, do you, can I share some good news with you today? Can I, can I tell you, as we're getting ready to come up on Easter, what, what this is all about for us Christians? I mean, that's, it's sad, isn't it, when you stop and think about it? That, that you're pretty well represented of the church here, ladies, and, and no, nobody's saying, yes, Jen. Amen. Amen. Ladies, you have the message of hope. Every Christian, every one of us has that message of hope that can that can share with the world. And we keep it locked up like it's the treasure just for us. And and we need to we need to realize that 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 truth that you have and you guys are so much better at it than men. And what I mean by that, women are more relationship oriented obviously uh, you can get to know each other a whole lot quicker and and have conversations with each other um, and I, I would just ask that you'd look inside your own circle wh wh who you're engaged with and and does everybody know or do you know that everybody that you're engaged with do you know that they know Christ or not and have you been able to share the word of God with them you know a lot of times we're you know Men, they, 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 they have this bravado around them and they don't want to uh, reveal anything. Um, uh, you women, you don't have that fakeness about you. Most guys, we, you know, we got impressed. We got a peacock, right? We, got right up. we don't want to see any weaknesses. You, you guys are a whole lot more secure in who you are. Right. Well said. You know, like when you really got into your study, you could compare them all and you can try to get more out of them. I didn't study it enough. Well, and that's a good point, Victoria. What I was thinking about as a man, I'm thinking when a man finds a chest of gold, what does he do with it? He ain't giving it to anybody else. He's keeping it for himself. And I know that. And I, and But I love the way you said it. I mean, that's great. Because if if we did appreciate what God did for us, if we really treasure what he did, then why wouldn't we want to do that? And that's well said, Victoria. It, it's a double-edged double -edged sword. Yes, Ruth. It's mixture, too. Like, that's what that goes to with the Bible. I talk about quoting because it's phenomenal. Yeah. I, use it, I use it to gain my life because that, like, this chapter is true. Like, phenomenal to me. But even three years later, you can still go through and get used to it. And then you don't feel that. Like, some of the things I talk about are still just phenomenal. Right. And I remember, Ruth, when that happened, I mean, I, I remember your excitement and your joy. And, and that's the privilege of being a shepherd. I get to see that from you ladies when, you know, when someone comes to Christ, I see that enjoyment. And my, my biggest fear is that is when we, we hit that wall and, and then you have to climb over it <laughs> because that, you, you have all the excitement, all the joy of your salvation and you do all this. And then all of a sudden you're, and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute. How come everybody ain't as excited as I am? <laughs> and then there, or you'll get people that say, whoa, 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 slow down. Well, you know, you don't need to be offending people. You don't need to be go telling people about Jesus all the time. Stay away from those people. Stay away from those people that tell you don't talk about the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it can be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. People say, well, you don't need to be pastor you don't need to be telling you know one fortunate thing here at grace harvest i've never had anybody come tell me go pastor you preach the gospel too much <laughs> we would have to get that person saved right <laughs> because if you're like me every time you hear the gospel on sunday morning is a reminder of what, what god saved us from reminder. um and so love is consistent with kindness, but it is not consistent with the compromising the truth. Remember that love is consistent with kindness. It is kind, but it doesn't compromise the truth. 
Com- you, you tell your children truth because you love them. Compromise the truth is not the kind of the, is not kind to those whom we mislead by your failure to stand firmly in the truth. This is love, John tells us. Second John six, Second John six. This is love, that we walk according to His commandments. It's right there in Scripture. Second Epistle of John. Chapter 6, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. To compromise, for example, with those who cast doubt on the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ is not loving, and it risks losing reward. Love, truth, and righteousness are inseparable. Love, truth, and righteousness, they're inseparable. And so that brings us to the... Uh, last four qualities here. The four qualities mentioned in verse 7. Those are 12 through 15 uh, of the numbers. So I'm going to read number 7 to you. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So here we have those uh, last four qualities mentioned in verse 7. And they're hyperbole. They're, they're exaggeration to make a point. Paul is saying when he says... It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. He's going back to his first uh, hyperbole in the first two verses of this chapter 13. He's trying to make a point. Paul has made it clear that love rejects jealousy. Love rejects boasting. Love rejects rudeness. Love rejects selfishness. Love rejects anger. Love rejects resentment. And love rejects unrighteousness. If it does not bear, believe, hope, or endure lies, false teachings, or anything else, that is not of God. Let me say that again. If it does not bear, believe, hope, or endure lies, false teachings, or anything else, that it is not of God. By all things, Paul is speaking of all things acceptable to God. He's not talking about all things. If those things are not Uh, scripturally uh, righteous then that's not what he's talking about he's talking about doing the right thing as far as scripture goes and that's acceptable God the four qualities listed here are closely related and are given in ascending order to bear all things basically means to cover or to support and therefore to protect okay to bear all things in the Greek is referring to covering or to support. So therefore it's to protect. Bearing all things you're protecting. Love protects all things. It bears all things by protecting others from exposure, ridicule, or harm. You will protect. You will help those brothers and sisters in Christ from harm and from ridicule. Genuine love does not gossip and it doesn't listen to gossip. It does not gossip and does not listen to gossip. Ladies, two of the, I'll share, I've shared it before, but it's been a while since I shared it. One of the things to protect yourself from spreading gossip or receiving gossip, gossip, gossip is this. If somebody starts telling you something and you realize they're gossiping, ask them, why are they telling you it to you? Why are you telling me this? Okay. That's the first question you ask. If somebody starts saying, you know, I, I love Pastor Moss, but <laughs> let me tell you what I saw him do the other day. Your first question should be, why are you telling me this? Do you need my help to go to the pastor? Have you addressed it with him? See, if you ask that question, it kind of nips it in the bud. And then the other question is, if you want to stop yourself from gossiping, ask yourself this question. Why am I telling this? Why am I telling you? It's two simple things. If I'm getting ready to say something to somebody, why am I telling you this? Why am I calling you on the phone? Why am I texting you? Is it for the edification? Do you truly desire to say, hey, I'm really concerned uh, about this. How do I deal with this? Uh, help me pray with for this. But the problem with too many times, ladies, our prayers become uh, an avenue for gossip. And we want to be careful that we don't cover it with a sanctimonious covering and say, well, 
let me share this with you so you can be praying with them. That's fine if that's your intent. There's nothing wrong with that. But you're the one that knows your intent. Why am I telling what I'm telling? Um, even when a sin is certain, even when a sin is certain, certain, love tries to correct it with the least possible hurt and harm to the guilty person. There's a reason that Christ set up church discipline the way he did. Let's, let's try to correct something as quickly and with the least amount of hurt to that individual, even if they are in sin. Our purpose is never to punish. Never. And, and even when you punish your children, are you doing it for the sake of punishing? No. You're doing it because you love them. And you're trying to correct it. Do you? Well, most of you don't get on the phone and start saying, let me tell you how bad my kids are. Right? It's the opposite. Let me tell you how wonderful my children are. And all, all you got to do is go to Facebook. Everybody's kids are perfect. I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't have Facebook because you all would hate my kids. But anyway, uh, I was younger. So, uh, but the fact of the matter is that, that we have a tendency to, to uh, um, expose what we think other people are doing wrong and try to make them feel guilty. Because why would you want to do that? To make yourself look better? You say, look, I'm not as bad as them. But understand that love never protects sin, but it's anxious to protect the sinner. Love doesn't protect sin, but we should be anxious to protect the one that's in the sin. They're confused. They don't understand. They're, they're naive, and they may not understand what they're doing. And so you try to do your best. You love on them. You pray with them. I, I, I can't tell you the number of times in the past 15 years of this ministry where I have spent almost all night up in prayer praying for people. Because I, I, you, they, they just can't see through the veil. And I was just as guilty in some of my sin in my life. And, and I am so thankful that I had men in my life that came to me and said, what are you doing? What is wrong with you? Love does not justify sin or compromise it with falsehoods. Love does not justify sin. We never condone sin. In our own life or in the life of others. So what does love do? It warns. That's what love does. It warns and it corrects. It exhorts. It rebukes. And it disciplines. Who is that an example of? Jesus. It's God himself. He warns us. Did not Jesus say... Uh, all through the Gospel of Matthew, we've got to his warning after warning after warning. Woe be unto you. It corrects us. God corrects us. He, he chastens us. He exhorts us. He commands us to do things. If you are my people, this is what you will do. If you love me, you will love the brethren. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he rebukes us. He rebukes us. His word tells us that your, do, God is not mocked. Do not be deceived. Your sin will find you out. King David thought he could get away with it, right? Commit adultery and murder. And he thought, I'll just, I'll just hide in the palace. I never figured out how he thought he was going to go away with that. I never thought how he'd go. He sends servants to go get Bathsheba. Brings Bathsheba to his house. You can imagine the gossip that went on there. And then, the, remember the, the um, commander who was given the duty to tell you, hey, put Uriah in the heat of battle? Here's a letter from the king. Basically, murder him and his men. Put him up in the heat of battle. Withdraw the rest of the army. Let the Philistines kill him. David's running around like he's the king and nothing can bother him, right? And God showed David that he will not be mocked. Our sin will find us out. And then he disciplines us. And the discipline can be harsh or it can be minor. Aren't you thankful that God is merciful in your life and that every time that you sin, you don't have to stand there and worry about God taking a, a big old stick and knocking you upside the head? Sometimes it would be easier if he did that, wouldn't it? But instead, he disciplines us. And, there, you know, when we sin, it's just like, again, like we tell our children, look, if, if you do A, then B is going to be the consequences. And if they choose to do A, 
And then B becomes the consequence. God looks at you and I and says, this is my best for you. This is my best for you. And I'm giving you my word. You want to live a joyful life? You want to pray without ceasing. Rejoice in all things. You want to live a joyful life? Rejoice in all things. When things don't go your way, rejoice in them. It's hard to rejoice when you're in pain. Just ask Jen or anyone else in here who's gone through pain. It's hard to rejoice in pain, but God tells us to rejoice in all of that. It's easy to rejoice when things are going well. It's easy to rejoice when we get married and we're newlyweds. We get our first, second home. Then we have a, a baby and another baby on the way. And God's blessed us with grandchildren. It's easy to rejoice in those things. What separates you, my sisters in Christ, from the world is you rejoice in your sufferings as well. And so God will bring all of this about so that we will love correctly. But here, this is important too. Love does not expose or broadcast failures and wrongs. It covers and protects. When you see two police officers, let me show you. When you see two police cars pulled up like this, and they're right next to each other, we're gossiping. That's what's going on. I'm going to tell you that right now. Speaking from experience. Hey, 116, 10, 5, 106. Go ahead, 116. 1025, me. We already knew where that was going to be. The location. I show up. I go, what you got? What you got? Did you hear what happened to so-and-so? No, man, tell me what happened. Oh. Then I'm 106, right? 106 to 145. 1025, me. I go over and tell him. And before the, sh before the hat shift was halfway over, the whole county knew what was going on. We're horrible. We're ho we were horrible. What do we do? We expose what somebody did wrong. And the Bible and God tells us that when we love, we protect. It should not happen within our church family. It should not happen within our church family. When, when somebody fails, everybody in the church should not know about it. Somebody falters. You need to be able to have the confidence that you come to me and the whole church is not going to know. You need to have the confidence that you can go to your elder. You need to have the confidence that you go to a sister in Christ and say, I need help. I'm sinning. Without worrying about that person, calling up the next person who will call up the next person. And you walk in, in church on Sunday and you might as well just hold up a sign. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you. Thank your sisters in Christ. Thank your brothers in Christ. We're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And we fail. And I have failed. I, I think I've shared this story not with all of you. But I, just, I remember discipling a, a young man in his 20s. And, and uh, we were downstairs in the old office I had downstairs. And I'm talking to him. He looked at me and said, Pastor, he said, you're gossiping. I wanted to crawl under my desk. Now, I didn't say, get out of my office. I can't believe you just told me that. I said, you're exactly right, and I am so sorry. And I want you to hold me accountable. I'm going to go to that person. I'm going to make contact with him and tell him I was talking about. You talk about hum humbling. Talking about keeping you in the right frame of mind. Let somebody that's 30 years, 40 years your junior tell you that you're doing something wrong in the faith. Uh, that, was a light, that was a lesson. See, none of us are perfect. None of us are above reproach uh, in the sense that we can't be corrected. We should be above reproach. Every Christian should be in the sense that we should be able to live our lives as an open book in front of other people and hide nothing. So selfless love believes all things. Love is not suspicious or cynical. It also believes in the best outcome for the one who has done the wrong. Okay? 
that the wrong will be confessed and forgiven and the loved one restored to righteousness. We hope it, we, 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 we believe that it will work out. We don't, we don't go into it thinking, oh, that person will never learn or that person uh, won't be corrected. No, we're not cynical. We shouldn't always be suspicious of other people's motives. Love also believes all things in another way. If there is doubt about a person's guilt or motivation, love will always opt for the most favorable possibility. I remember three or four years ago, I had somebody who, who I, I love dearly in this church, another man. He's in a position of leadership. And he came to me and he was aggravated and upset with me over, over an email I sent him. And, and I said, well, I'm sorry, what, what, what did I do? And he showed it to me and I said, that's not what I was saying. I said, my first question is, why would you take it that way? What he did was he took, when he reread it, and when I explained myself, he wound up apologizing. But my point was, he immediately went to the negative side of the, he needed, immediately went there. What I always do with your text and your emails and even phone calls is I always go to the positive first. Now, I'm not perfect in that, in every circumstance, but that, that's, that's my default. That's what I, I go to. I, I and, and even after I, I have a conversation, I'll sit back and I'll, and I'll reflect on the conversation and I'll say, you know, even if that person was wrong, they were right to some degree that they felt strong enough to come and tell, tell me. So that's looking at it in love, that this person is coming to me with the intent that they care enough about me to explain their situation to me. And that what I appreciate about this church is, is every believer I've ever dealt with in this church, they will listen. And I will give the same respect to them as well and to you as well. And we should do that to one another. We should believe all things. Don't go to the negative right away. Don't do that. You'll save yourself a whole lot of grief. And if you go to the negative and you fume on it and you don't even tell the person, and then what happens? That kind of festers. And that rot inside festers. And this person may never have even meant it the way you thought they meant it, but you, you, you conjure up in your mind that they are this despicable person. And next thing you know, you're not even talking to them and you're trashing them. When uh, Charles Allen, before he became a member here, and, and I'm free to tell this story. He, um, he walked in my office. Did I tell you all this one yet? I have told you this one. So that, that's a perfect example of it. Where he thought I had offended him. I didn't even was aware that I had, and he said, I held this grudge all that time. We don't want to do that. Love always believes all things. And even if it turns out to be guilty, love will give credit for the best positive motive for why they did it. Even when they are guilty, you will still. I'm, what I'm basically asking you is to love your fellow Christians as you love your own children. Because there's not a mother in this room or a grandmother in this room that won't cover up what their children do with love. We do. You mothers will love when the fathers will turn their backs on their own children. When, when, uh, when, when, when I used to arrest people, it wasn't, it wasn't dads who called or were worried about them. It was always the moms. Those men sitting on death row, they get visits from moms, not from dads. Love trusts, love has confidence, and love believes. This is a principle that I live by. As I said before, my default is to think that people mean their best. And if I'm proven wrong, so what? It's better to have that attitude and that desire in life than always walking around with people thinking they're trying to get you. Or, or you're always thinking people are trying to get you. And you know, and here, here's something else. Whenever there is a doubt... We would rather err on the side of grace. Whenever there's a doubt, we err on the side of grace. Job's friends showed few signs of love. So we've, if you've been through the study, what the elders did, they were ready to believe the worst about him, being thoroughly convinced that his problems could only have been caused by his sin. 
They gave Job no benefit of the doubt because they had no true love for him. You see, if the, his friends had lived this 1 Corinthians 13, they would have been true friends to him. But yet, what did they do? They weren't friends when he needed them. And love is a place of trust. When that trust is broken, love's first reaction is to heal and restore. Okay? Love is a place of trust. But when that trust is broken, love's first reaction is to heal and restore. Hatred is to divide and conquer. Love desires heal, healing and restoration between parties. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such as one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you be tempted. It's a good lesson for all of us. Selfless love hopes all things. It is not pessimistic. It does not expect the one love to fail, but to succeed. Even when belief in a loved one's goodness or repentance is shattered, love still hopes. Love still hopes. And then selfless love endures all things. So when you look at the word endure, it's a military word, meaning a, to, to sustain an assault upon an enemy. So when they use the word endure here, selfless love endures all things. Think of it as a military assault. It has the idea of holding up under trial, of perseverance in spite of any difficulty that you may be going through. It means that love hangs in there when things get tough. It's not just passive or stoic attitude it's a positive triumphant spirit that sticks it out when others would fail that's why when i sit down with a couple that's getting ready to get married i look at you and i said the world says divorce is an option i'm telling you that god says it's not except for two specific reasons so when you this is a time for you all to to look at one another and decide whether or not you're going to get married and this is the person that god has really providentially put in your life to spend the rest of your life with because you you will grow old with this person and they look at me and they're thinking oh yeah i'll love i'll love her forever i'll love him forever and then what happens i can tell you in all the years of uh that i have been doing premarital counseling i have had uh just one couple divorce in all the years that I've married people. And it's not that I've done. It's what God's doing in their life. Understanding that when you make that commitment to marry, you're, you're making that one for life. You know, I, I, I told Kathy this morning, I told her yesterday, I said, I said, babe, I was looking in the mirror, and the sun was shining through, and there was these little streaks of gray coming on top of my head. And she goes, I don't see them. She's being so sweet. So this morning I was just standing in the mirror again, and there they were, the little students, right? And I went over to her mirror and I said, look, put your glasses on. <laughs> and you can see them. And, and I thought to myself, we'll be married 44 years this June. And I thank God that I'm allowed to grow old with my wife. I told, I told her um, the other day, I, I, ha I had the closest thing you'll ever, that I'll have. To, I had an, one anxiety attack in my life. I've had one. That's it. And I'm glad I had it because it helped me understand when, what people go through when they have one. I, I had never experienced one. I had one when I just got promoted to sergeant, and uh, it, was, it was horrible. It was just a total sense of loss, of control, panic came in. I was like, oh, this is crazy. And I've never had one since. But I had one the other day. I was sitting there, Kathy was in, in, on the couch, it was late afternoon, she gets really tired in the afternoon, and she's in the couch, and, I, and uh, I, I was looking at Facebook, and I saw a picture of a man, and he was laying on the floor next to his wife who was on a couch, anybody else see that, see that one? And he's holding his wife's hand, I'm going to try to get through this while I break it down, he's holding his wife's hand, and they're probably in their late 70s and she says to him I want to die right here don't take me to the hospital I just want to hold your hand 
And I just lost it. This overwhelming sense of my wife being gone, it just consumed me like a tidal wave. I started to breathe really heavy. I could not control my weeping. I was an emotional ball sitting there on the edge of my bed. And it's the really the first time in my life I said, what would I do if my wife wasn't here? If that was me and that was Kathy on the couch and she was laying on the couch, I was on it. And I just wept and wept. And then, of course, you don't want, to see, you, you don't want your wife to see you like that because, you know. Are you okay there? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Go in the bathroom, splash water in your face and come in. And, and I told her what I'd done. And, you know, of course, you know, it's a blessing. That's what I'm saying to go. Now, I told that story to my wife, you know, I mean, to my daughter. You know what my daughter said? Dad. <laughs> Dad, you're getting old. <laughs> That's my daughter's answer to everything. But the point is that Christian, Christian woman, our desire should to be love the way God loves. And if we love the way God loves, our love will hope, it will endure, it will stay in the battle to the very end. Even when you don't think that the battle's worth fighting. Even when you have struggled and struggled and struggled and you have husbands that you feel like they're just not getting it. Understand that God knows and he still calls us to be obedient even in the struggles. Remember, your pastor is not perfect and there were times when Kathy could have sat there years and years ago and you would have never thought I, the, the man that stands here now was that man then. But through my wife's faithful prayers and other people that were in my life, God decided to use a broken piece of nasty clay and mold it. And if he can do that with me, he can do it with anybody. He can do it with any one of your husbands. But he can do it with you too. Meditate on these and think about yourself. If I was to read this to you again, and I'll close after I read this with prayer, does this describe your love? Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Father, I know this is the best, and Lord, do I fall short in so many of these areas. But I thank you, Father, that you are growing in me and in my sisters. And I pray for myself and them as well, Lord. May we strive to love this way. God, this side of heaven, we will make mistakes. We will fall. We will stumble. And yet, Lord, you're there right by our side when we fall. And we know, Father, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us when, we, when it is your desire for us to, to be holy as you are holy. Help us to do that, Father. Help us to be men and women, Lord, that desire to be as much like your son as we can during this life. Father, I pray for my sisters that you would give them, Father, such a glorious day today. I pray, Father, that their joy is in you and in their families and those they love. And I thank you, Father, that you allow me the privilege to be their shepherd. I ask all this in the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amy.